Hi there, AP Euro students, and welcome to today's lecture, Unit 7, Section 4, The Age of Mass Society. <clears throat> the theme for today's lecture is going to be social organization and development, and our objective, which is also your write-up, is to explain the continuities and changes that occurred in European society from 1850 to 1914. So before we dive into the social topics, I want to take a little bit of time to look at the industrial economy and the state of the economy across Europe in the later 19th century, because of course that will affect um, the social developments as well. So by the second half of the, 18, of the 19th century, we are in the second industrial revolution. And so that means new industries, new technologies, and other notable um, um, differences from the first half of the century. From about 1871 to 1895, the European economy was actually somewhat unstable. There were a series of economic crises in different parts of the continent at different times. Some historians even characterize it as a depression. The prices of agricultural products fell there were also slumps in business um, cycles that led to reduced profits. However, this recession occurred at different times, at different places. It was not a blanket recession or depression like we will see in the 1920s and 1930s. However, one of the lasting consequences that this economic stability had on Europe is that it did contribute to a rise in anti-Semitism. However, by the time we get to the last part of the 19th century and even turn the corner into the 20th century, we are entering what is seen as a golden age of European civilization known as La Belle Epoque. La Belle Epoque is sometimes seen even as early as the 1870s, 1880s, depending on where you are in Europe. This is characterized as a period of economic boom and prosperity, like I mentioned a golden age of European civilization. This period was characterized by optimism, relative peace across the continent, and significant technological innovation, scientific discoveries, and new cultural and artistic movements, which led to a flourishing of the arts that we learned about in a previous lecture. Germany also replaced Britain as the industrial leader of Europe in the second half of the century. This is for a few reasons. First, Britain's early lead actually made it more difficult for Britain to modernize their factories and their techniques. Also, British entrepreneurs were suspicious of new technologies and were therefore reluctant to invest. The British also did not form um, as much scientific and technical education in their state uh, whereas Germany did, and many of the new fields in the second half of the 19th century and in the second industrial revolution required more training and more scientific knowledge for these scientists and these engineers and these industrialists. And so Germany supported that relationship between science and technology by investing significantly in their education and their training for new scientists. So Germany, again, will replace Britain as the industrial leader of Europe. Now, Europe is also divided more or less into two economic zones during the later 19th century. We have our, our advanced industrialized core, which includes Britain, Belgium, France, the Netherlands, Germany, Austria, and Northern Italy, so primarily Western and or Northern Europe. This advanced industrialized core enjoyed a higher standard of living, decent transportation, and a an healthy, well-educated population. However, we also had the peripheral uh, areas of Europe, which had a much weaker industry and economy. That included parts of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Spain, Portugal, Russia, the Balkans, we can also add southern Italy to this list, and this is because these region, regions were largely agricultural. Uh, they provided food and raw materials for the advanced industrialized core, and industrialization was slow to take hold in these regions. 
Now, this economic division of a wealthier Western and, and Northern Europe and a poorer Southern and Eastern Europe, this continues well into the 20th century and even to some extent is aggravated with the development of communism following World War II. However, we are starting to see the development of a true world economy unlike anything we've seen before. <clears throat> new technologies and new means of communication and transportation resulted in a truly global economic network. This network was dominated by Europe, of course, because of its industrial and military superiority. And this world economy also emerged because of new patterns in agriculture. For example, lower transportation prices also caused many food prices to drop, notably various types of grain. Also, agricultural labor was now scarce and more expensive because of the increased use of machines and technology. And finally, some countries began specializing in some foods over others. So there might be regions of Europe that would specialize in dairy or regions that would specialize in another type of food production. And that expanded beyond Europe as well, whereas certain regions of the world, which frequently became European colonies, could provide certain raw materials or certain food products that may not be available in Europe. And due to advanced and increased transportation, those food products and those raw materials could reach a wider market. Another uh, indicator of the spread of the world economy was the spread of the Industrial Revolution to Japan and, of course, to the United States. Specifically in Japan, the imperial government embraced and promoted new industry. The Japanese government built railroads, they hired foreign experts, and they provided a new universal education system based on applied science. So like the Germans, they invested heavily in scientific and industrial training. However, the Japanese did experience many of the same issues that came with rapid industrialization and urbanization, such as significant gaps between the rich and the poor, a low standard of living, uh, miserable living and working conditions for some, all of these things would also occur in Japan, just as we saw them occur in Europe. And finally, the last point about the world economy, which I sort of already mentioned, is that the imperialism that begins to take place in the second half of the 19th century will focus now on Asia and Africa. And as European countries conquer territory in Africa and in Asia, this will open up new markets for their manufactured goods, but also provide new resources and new raw materials that are shipped back to Europe. We will learn a lot more about the new imperialism of this period in a later lecture. And finally, the last point on this slide is the development of women's work in this industrial economy. The second industrial revolution had an enormous impact on women in the labor market. And there even began to, began to be some question of whether or not women had the right to work. Of course, there were many arguments that women needed to stay home <clears throat> to ensure the moral and physical well-being of their families. And the reality of the situation is that it was easier to exploit women economically. Uh, even the jobs that were available to women were usually pretty awful, pretty dismal, and always paid less than the male workers. After about 1870, there were more job opportunities for women. These are sometimes known as white-collar jobs, and we'll discuss those more in a moment. The development of larger industrial plants and the expansion of government services create a large number of service or white-collar jobs. So think of like clerks and bureaucrats working in the offices of various governments or businesses. Um, these jobs usually had lower wages and also not, there were not very many male workers who were able to fill these jobs. And so this led to an increase in uh, work for women. And so women increasingly came to occupy um, jobs such as clerks, typists, secretaries, file clerks, and sales clerks. They also worked as teachers, as telephone operators, and as nurses.
By 1911, women held more than half of the jobs in the post office and in the government's uh, clerical jobs in that early 19th century period in Britain. Now, unfortunately, there was little hope for advancement in these jobs, but it did offer opportunities for middle-class daughters to work or also working-class women to escape the dirty work of the lower-class world, such as domestic work or working in the factories. Now, even though there were the more attractive job opportunities, like these white-collar jobs becoming available, uh, the less attractive option of prostitution was still a common um, last result, result for women, unfortunately. Many lower-class women were forced to become prostitutes to, sur to survive, especially in big cities like Paris and London. Uh, we saw an example of this in the movie Les Miserables. Usually, they only were active in this occupation for a short time. Um, they often preferred to enter the workforce in another job or get married or find anything else other than working as a prostitute. And prostitution was actually much more common in European countries than we're used to seeing in American history. And this is because many European countries actually regulated prostitution, uh, required licenses, and established uh, brothels, which were houses specifically for the practice of prostitution. Moving on to the next slide, which is changing society and the urban environment. Now, there is going to be dramatic population growth in Europe in the second half of the 19th century. Uh, the population of Europe increased by 50% between 1870 and 1914 alone. By the year 1900, at the start of the 20th century, nine European cities had populations over one million people. This is largely due to the decline in death rates which was made possible because of medical discoveries, such as the smallpox vaccine and other immunological science, and also improved environmental conditions and new efforts in urban sanitation in many of these major cities. Also, improved nutrition due to agricultural productivity and the process of pasteurization made food safer and more available for people to eat, so people, ha people had a better diet and were well-fed. And the number of children in each family started to decrease, um, though this trend was more pronounced in the middle class and in the working classes, and we'll explain why that is shortly. Due to this uh, dramatic population increase, there was actually a lot of excess labor uh, in various parts of Europe that was forced to emigrate, to move to a different location to find work. One of the most common forms of migration was from rural to urban areas. There was significant migration to cities from the countryside that continued throughout the 19th century, although it was not uncommon for these migrants to maintain a connection to their rural areas, usually through language or culture or some other type of practice. People were mostly moving out of the underdeveloped and poor areas of Europe. So again, think of like Eastern Europe and Southern Europe, that, that sort of economic periphery that isn't as well developed or industrialized. People would move out of those regions into the more advanced industrialized core. However, these industrial areas could not absorb everyone. And so that leads to the second level of migration, where people moved from Europe all the way to the Americas. During this period, huge numbers of Southern and Eastern Europeans migrated to America's largest cities um, in search of economic opportunity. This is where many of us probably can trace ancestors back to migrating over to the United States, many of whom came through Ellis Island and other ports like that. About half of all of these European migrants came to the United States, uh, but others went to Canada or south to Latin America. Many Jews in Eastern Europe uh, were part of this migration as they fled the persecution of the pogroms, especially in Russia. And many of these people were also fleeing uh, areas that had failed agriculture. They're, they were not, no longer able to support themselves in agriculture. This is especially common in 
southern Italy, and so they moved either to uh, cities in Western Europe or all the way across the Atlantic to, um, to the Americas. Now, the second half of the 19th century also sees rapid urbanization. Britain was the first large European country to experience this level of economic and uh, urban growth. By 1914, about 80% of the British population lived in cities, and London was by far the largest city in Europe. By the end of the 19th century, there were about 6.5 million people in London. Industrialization continued to attract these huge number of workers to the cities, and as we know, this working class became known as the proletariat, and people were driven out of the countrysides out of sheer economic necessity. Fortunately, the health and the living conditions improved significantly in these cities during the second half of the 19th century, which brings us to the next bullet point, is that there was an increased emphasis on public health. Many cities wanted to remedy the high disease and mortality rate that was common in urban areas. Now this also, this movement, represents a significant shift from classical liberalism, which we saw more from governments in the first half of the century, to a more modern form of liberalism uh, that emphasizes social welfare in the second half of the century. You may remember the reformer Edwin Chadwick. Edwin Chadwick had been a British social reformer, and he was one of the most influential figures in advocating for improving living conditions in the cities. Edwin Chadwick was also influenced uh, a lot by Jeremy Bentham and the theory of utilitarianism, which, as you may remember, is the greatest good for the greatest number. And so Chadwick's efforts, along with others, led to the passage of several public health acts in Britain's history. Specifically, the Public Health Act of 1875 in Britain created uh, running water and sewage systems in the cities. This is part of what is called the sanitary idea that led to improved water and sewage systems um, in cities across Western Europe in the late 19th century. This was a dramatic engineering feat that also significantly improved the health of urban cities. Being able to dispose of human waste and provide clean drinking water is so important for urban health and sanitation. And so by the 1860s and 1870s, many European cities had made significant pro uh, progress in the area of public sanitation. This also supported the fact that many urban centers were redesigned in the second half of the 19th century. So public health also supported the redesign of many of these major cities. The older layout of these cities that was common in, say, the Middle Ages and early modern era was much more compact with defensive walls. But this was no longer practical with the expanding urban population. These cities kept growing and growing. And so as a result, working class slums were frequently demolished and replaced with um, things like retail stores and museums and cafes and theaters and parks, basically areas that became recreation for the middle class. And those working class slums would be established somewhere else. France, of course, took the lead in this process during the reign of Napoleon III when Baron Haussmann was hired to redesign the city of Paris, and other cities would follow that lead, notably Vienna and Berlin and others. Part of this redesign also included the incorporation of public transportation. By the 1890s, the electric streetcar had revolutionized city transportation. And this facilitated the creation of suburbs on the outskirts of cities, which, of course, were neighborhoods for the middle class. And also, as the cities expanded, the population would spill into neighboring villages. Those villages became incorporated, which, of course, allowed for the expansion of these suburbs. Also, electricity in the later part of the century led to the creation of London's subway system in the 1860s, and then Paris also began to build their metro system 
in 1900. And of course, subways and metros and trains became a very important factor in, for public transportation in Europe, and they still are. So now we can take a closer look at how these economic developments are affecting social structure in the, in the, in the age of mass society. Most notably, there was an increase in the standard of living during the second half of the 19th century. Obviously, the Industrial Revolution and urbanization had produced significant changes in social structure in the early 19th century. But those social structures continued to adapt throughout the century. However, the gap between the wealthy and the working class was still huge. And this period, especially the later 19th century, is sometimes referred to as the golden age of the middle class, the golden age of the bourgeoisie. Now specifically, we can see how the standard of living increased in Britain. So earlier in Britain, wages and consumption, meaning consumerism, had already increased by about 50% between 1820 and 1850. Um, and now, increased wages and consumerism could be seen elsewhere in Europe in this post-1850 period. And this increase in the standard of living and the increase in wages, it did not happen all at once, of course. It came in waves and affected different parts of Europe at different times. But it ultimately, it, this made society more diverse and less unified. So the very upper class um, has not changed significantly. This includes the plutocrats and the aristocrats. They made up about the wealthiest 5% of the population, so 5% of the population total, and they were by far the wealthiest group. In fact, they controlled about 30 to 40% of all the wealth in Europe. Now, plutocrats is the term we use for that new money, people who have made their money since the start of the Industrial Revolution. This includes industrialists, bankers, merchants, um, and those types. And then aristocrats, that's the old money, the people who were members of the nobility and had had wealth and title and land for generation. However, aristocratic wealth was declining in the later part of the century, and more and more wealth could be found with these plutocrats or even in the upper middle class. Now, this group was almost always educated and had important professional jobs, and it also was increasingly common to see the old nobility and aristocracy um, go into business or arrange marriage with the plutocrats, with the new money, in order to sustain their social position. Next, we have probably the most significant and influential group, which was the middle class, also known as the bourgeoisie. This group expanded and diversified during the Second Industrial Revolution, because of the growing demand for experts with specialized knowledge. Now, overall, this group made up about 15 to 20 percent of the population in Western Europe. They were not as common in Eastern Europe. Only 2 percent of the population of Russia was considered middle class, and this is because nobles continued to dominate business even in Eastern Europe. Now, we first had the upper middle class. The upper middle class included bankers, industrial leaders, people involved with large-scale commerce, top government officials. These families were considerably wealthy and often employed several servants to support their lifestyle. But there was also a lot of diversity to the middle class. Below the upper middle class, we have sort of what you might call the middle middle class, and this included smaller businessmen, professionals like doctors and lawyers or professors, merchants, civil servants, and this group still enjoyed uh, uh, relatively comfortable lives. They usually employed at least one servant um, as a cook and as a maid to support their lifestyle. And then we have the lower middle class, which was sometimes referred to as the petite bourgeoisie. And this included independent shopkeepers or small merchants, store managers, minor civil servants, teachers, clerks, and even some master craftsmen such as goldsmiths. And this lower middle class grew from about 7% of the population to being about 20% of the population by the year 1900. 
This group often provided goods and services for the people above them in the social ladder, but they also worked to emulate the culture and character of the middle class. They wanted to make it very clear to everyone that they were not part of the working class. They were still considered part of the middle class. And this is the group in where we start to see those increased career opportunities for women, such as the growth of these white collar worker jobs. So white collar workers, I mentioned a little bit, but I'd like to talk about them in more detail now. White collar workers were a product of the second industrial revolution. And this included um, jobs such as traveling sales representatives, bookkeepers or accountants, bank tellers, telephone operators, this department store sales clerks, secretaries, and other clerical jobs in business and government. These jobs were usually occupied by the lower middle class and sometimes even the working class. And people in these jobs were committed to maintaining middle class values and improving their social economic status. Now the reason these jobs are called white collar is because the employee could wear a white collar to work and it wouldn't get physically dirty, unlike the work in, say, a factory or working as a domestic servant. These days, we tend to think of white collar jobs as being more high level professional jobs, like doctors and lawyers and professors or, or wealthy businessmen and things like that. But historically, these white collar workers are more like clerks and low level bureaucrats and salesmen and, and jobs like that. Now, of course, the middle class was the most influential culturally because of the many characteristics we see uh, from the middle class that ultimately define society and its values and its culture during this period. The middle class believed strongly in classical liberalism and sought protection of property, of their own property, in constitutional assemblies. The middle class often gained political influence through increased land ownership that was usually tied to voting rights. And politically, they emphasized individual liberty and respectability based on economic success. Expanding the family's fortune was seen as the clearest means of respectability. Also, these families emphasized frugality, which meant not spending a lot of money, and planning smartly for the future. They believed that hard work was the primary human good and an important value. And this is also why many middle class families limited the number of children that they had because the, the greater the amount of children, the more this might affect their socioeconomic status. The middle class saw the family as the foundation of the social order. And education and religion, especially the evangelical Protestantism in England, the Netherlands, and some German states, and even Catholicism in France, was seen as extremely important. And so, as you may remember, the middle class had an important emphasis on traditional Christian morality. The middle classes also accepted and promoted the importance of progress and science. They also held strong feelings about nationalism. Overall, Victorian Britain in the 19th century was probably the best model of a middle class society and their culture and their values were very influential to middle class society all across the continent of Europe as well. And finally, that brings us to the working class or the lower classes which made up about 80% of the population. This group also became known as the proletariat. And so that's a term you want to make sure you understand in the context of the working class. Many people in the working class still worked as peasants and hired hands, um, such as agricultural laborers, especially in Eastern Europe and Southern Europe. Overall, the working class was less unified and less homogenous than the middle classes. It did include some highly skilled workers that were more at the top of the working class, maybe about 15% of that overall population. This was sometimes known as the labor aristocracy. And this could include construction bosses, foremen, or other highly skilled craftsmen. 
There were also semi-skilled workers. This included jobs in carpentry, bricklaying, or more successful factory workers. And then the vast majority were considered unskilled workers, which often worked some of the more dismal jobs in the factories where labor was very disposable, or they worked as domestic servants, although mostly women worked as domestic servants. The, this unskilled labor was at the bottom. By about 1900, over half of the working women in England worked as domestic servants. And also older children made up about 14% of the workers in British textile factories in 1874. Now many, now, many peasants and members of the proletariat tried to share the values of the middle class um, in their demeanor, in their values, of course, supporting that traditional Christian morality as much as possible. However, after 1870, we do finally start to see real improvement in the living and working conditions of the proletariat. Um, the, at times, in certain places, members of the proletariat might even have some leisure time and disposable money to enjoy the recreational activities uh, afforded to the middle class. Now there's also going to be some significant changes occurring in the European family structure, such as new marriage patterns. Romantic love became the most important reason for marriage by 1850 but a companionate, companionate marriage was still the ideal, meaning that people still, yes, they wanted to marry for love, but more than anything, they wanted to get married so that they had a companion for um, economic security. The rising standard of living in the later part of the century made it possible for people to marry at younger ages. But economic status was still an important issue uh, for many groups, the lower class and especially the middle class. Middle class women were monitored extremely closely by their parents, and this is reflective of those traditional Christian morals, because chastity, meaning their virginity, was paramount. It was the most important thing. However, middle class boys were not monitored nearly as much as the girls. Fidelity in marriage, that means loyalty in marriage, was particularly emphasized in the middle class, again, as a traditional Christian value. Um, and the high rate of illegitimacy among the working class decreased after 1850. So that means there were not as many children being born out of wedlock. Now, the high rate of premarital sex uh, continued, but more couples would choose to marry if a woman became pregnant. And also prostitution remained an option for, um, for some women. However, the customers of those prostitutes were usually middle and upper class men because men were able to wait and marry later in life and they tended to frequent prostitutes to entertain themselves in the meantime. Now let's look a little bit more closely at the role of women in the second half of the 19th century. Women remained legally inferior and largely defined by their family and their household roles. This is um, closely connected to how the middle class glorified domesticity. Marriage was seen as the most honorable and available career for women. And frankly, it was also an economic necessity because uh, the single life for women could be very difficult. Most middle class women uh, were able to afford to stay home and be a wife and mother. And also many of the new consumer products of the period made life easier for these stay at home middle class women. The middle class also began to limit the size of their families. Um, children, were, uh, because they wanted to maintain a certain socioeconomic status, children were seen as dependents and not as wage earners. And therefore, um, children and parents began to develop closer, more affectionate relationships. And there were many changing attitudes towards children, um, and uh, families began to encourage more childhood activities and let children be children. And now there were children's games and toys and other consumer products marketed for this age group and this sort of period of childhood.
overall, there was a decline in the birth rate and also um, some use of birth control in the later 19th century, especially after 1880. A very important factor in the evolution of the modern family, which continues into the 20th century, was a decline in the number of children born to the average woman. And so middle-class families tried to uh, utilize more family planning to limit the number of their children. Um, and working class families did as well. But of course, there were no effective forms of birth control in this period. And that sometimes meant that um, women resorted to more unfortunate options like abortion or infanticide or abandonment. And so that actually encouraged um, the more acceptable uh, forms of family planning, which was largely abstinence at this point. Overall, women were defined in a lot of ways by the cult of middle-class domesticity. Middle-class mothers had more time for childcare. They had more time for domestic leisure, but still there was this belief that leisure should be used for constructive purposes. Because again, hard work was the primary good, according to the middle class. Middle class women did have the support of domestic servants to maintain their middle class lifestyle and image. But many middle class families actually struggled more than they liked to admit. Most middle class families could only afford one servant, if anything. And the last point I'd like to make about middle class domesticity is this idea of Christmas, because Christmas is often seen as um, sort of this pinnacle of domesticity surrounding a family and it's centered in a home and it's all about good food and warmth and affection. And so a lot of the traditions we associate with Christmas in Western culture comes from Europe in this period, specifically uh, Britain during the Victorian era. So it was essentially the Victorians who created our modern family Christmas with traditions like Christmas trees and, and Christmas carols, exchanging gifts, um, a lot of the decorations and the, and the appearance of Christmas also comes from this time period. And Charles Dickens, a, realist, uh, a realistic novelist that we mentioned, sort of epitomized a lot of this new Christmas tradition in his novel, A Christmas Carol. Moving on now to separate spheres. After 1850, the work of most wives was increasingly distinct from their husband. Now, this stood in stark contrast with pre-industrial Europe, where husbands and wives worked together in farming and in the cottage industry. Now, husbands were the primary family wage earners, and child rearing was the role of the woman. And child rearing became much more centered around the child because the wife dominated the home. Middle class women eventually, however, began to organize and resist the second class status that they had in comparison to their husbands. As we get into the early 20th century, we'll start to see the emergence of early feminist activity, where middle class women might demand access to higher education or professional employment, and they also wanted to repeal laws that denied women property ownership. Now we will learn more about the feminist movement later in this unit when we get to mass politics. Now child rearing in middle class families also had changed significantly. The lower mortality rates for children resulted in parents becoming more emotionally involved in their children's lives. The high mortality rate in pre-industrial Europe had often resulted and mothers becoming rather indifferent to their children. For example, those mothers might hire wet nurses to nurse their children instead of doing it themselves. But now mothers increasingly breastfed their own children. Married couples also decreased the number of children that they had, especially in the middle class, because they wanted to provide more care to their children and also maintain a certain socioeconomic status. And this trend of fewer children in, the, in families continued well after World War II in Europe. There were more products for, uh, for children and more products such as books on child rearing, toys, clothes, things like that for children. 
and parents were now much more intent on improving the economic and social condition of their children. Now, child rearing in working class families was not quite as leisurely or luxurious. Yes, there were improved conditions for working class mothers and children, but unlike middle class children, the working class children did not remain economically dependent on their families. Usually, working class boys and girls went to work for themselves as soon as they reached adolescence. Um, they would break away from the family and go work as a domestic servant or in a factory or something else. And this actually um, became a pattern that the middle class children and teenagers would eventually start to follow later in the 20th century, um, as also there we see more of the youth movement and more independence for the youth in the post-war uh, period of Europe. But that's another story for another day.